Well, friends, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it together apart from wherever we are. As we begin our worship this morning, I'm going to invite you to take a couple of moments to uh, breathe ourselves and pray ourselves and center ourselves into our worship. Um, if you would like to use the centering prayer that we have for today, I invite you to breathe in and pray the words, one in spirit, God. And as you breathe out, pray one in you. One in spirit, one in you. So I invite you to use that prayer or whatever way you come to God best. Let's take a few moments. Please pray with me. We all come to you from different spaces this morning, God. Different spaces in our world, different spaces in our understanding, different spaces in our spirits. We all come to you with different gifts, different blessings, different struggles, different fears. But still, we all come to you. And we come praising those differences, God, because they make your world more beautiful. Our differences reveal to us the varied elegance and grace of who you are, because we are all made in your image. Help us to find our place today, God, that special, sacred place you have just for us in this world, in your church, and in your arms. Amen. Friends, we're going to continue our Different Ways to Pray series um, with the next chapter of Kneeling with Giants by Gary Hansen. Uh, today, we're praying with, um, praying with the pilgrim. This form of prayer comes from the pilgrim's tale or the way of the pilgrim, which was, um, is an anonymous story that was written um, in the 19th century in Russia. It's kind of an amalgamation of stories from a lot of different people. Um, there's no one author. And the Pilgrim's Tale tells the story of a young pilgrim who travels as he attempts to live Paul's directive to pray without ceasing from First Thessalonians. The tale, this tale of the pilgrim is kind of what brought um, an awareness and a deeper understanding of Orthodox Christianity to the Western world. Um, Gary says the Pilgrim's Tale is the simplest place to learn the practice at the heart of what's called hesychasm in the, in the Orthodox Church, or stillness, a spiritual ideal of orthodoxy. Prayer leads us to quiet, inward stillness in the presence of God, where we are neither distracted by passions nor pouring out noisy words. This way of the Pilgrim introduces what's called the Jesus Prayer. And it's pretty simple. You pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. It's a breath prayer. It's a centering prayer, kind of like the one we use at the beginning of our worship service. It's a prayer that helps refocus us when our thoughts are wandering in prayer. I know that sometimes we sit down to pray and we want to be really earnest and we want to be really dedicated, but there's so much going on inside of us and around us and we get distracted while we're trying to pray, right? And this prayer can help bring us back to focus. It can help bring about that quietness that we offer, often desire for our times of prayer. And it puts Christ back at the center of our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Now, Gary says that the purpose of this kind of prayer is it's a tool to bring the whole person together, heart, mind, and body into the presence of God. There in holy awe, passions and thoughts are stilled. It is thus a contemplative kind of prayer. Drawing near to God, we use the Jesus prayer to remain before God breath by breath, aiming our gaze toward God. 
As we pray, we are contemplating the one who is our Lord rather than our servant. The Jesus known in the gospels, the Christ who fulfills salvation history, the son of God, and asking for mercy, we depend on God for our every need. So there are kind of three levels to the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me. The first level of this prayer is you just say the prayer over and over again. You can pick a certain number of times that you're going to say it. You're going to repeat it five times, 10 times, 15 times. You can pick a certain amount of time that you're gonna spend repeating it. You're gonna repeat it for a minute or two minutes, or you can pick a certain activity during the day in which you are going to spend that time repeating this prayer. For example, uh, when you're brushing your teeth, you're going to brush your teeth and pray this prayer. This gives us the time to kind of embody this prayer, to take it into ourselves. The more we repeat it, the more it becomes a part of us. So once that prayer has become ingrained in you, then we get to the second stage where you begin to meditate on the meaning of the words that you are praying. What does it mean to call anyone Lord? Who was Jesus? What does Christ mean? And so on with each word of the prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Now with enough repetition and contemplation, the prayer will slowly become a part of the fabric of your life and of your being. And then we come to the third stage. Even within a short time, the words of the Jesus prayer can begin to take on a life of their own so that they do seem to come up from inside unbidden. This is that stage where you find yourself literally praying without ceasing. You've said this prayer so many times that it comes up in your heart and in your mind in those moments when you're not doing anything. That's the goal, consciously or unconsciously to have this prayer on your breath, on your heart, on your spirit, even on your lips, if you would rather pray it out loud. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. So I invite you to try this prayer this week as a way to center yourself, to bring yourself to God in a new way, maybe in a familiar way if it's something you've done before. I invite you to give it a shot. So friends, our scripture reading for this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Paul says, now I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. My brothers and sisters, Chloe's people gave me some information about you that you're fighting with each other. What I mean is this, that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? Thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that nobody can say they were baptized in my name. Oh, I baptized the house of Stephanus too. Otherwise, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And Christ didn't send me to preach the good news with clever words so that Christ's cross will be emptied of its meaning. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those who are being saved. Friends, this is the gospel of the Lord. May it be a blessing to our hearts. Please pray with me. Holy God, bring your word into our hearts this morning, into our minds and into our lives. Help it it knit us together. Help your word bind us to you and to each other in a message of hope and love. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So 
So we have this book, surprise, surprise, that we love to read at our house. It's a fabulous children's book called Where Oliver Fits uh, by Kale Atkinson. And it's a story about a little puzzle piece. I'm gonna try and show it to y'all. This little puzzle piece named Oliver who is looking for his perfect place, for his fit. Now, Oliver has big dreams. He can't wait to be part of the bigger picture. Something exciting, something wild, something out of this world. But poor little Oliver is having trouble finding his fit. He tries a bunch of different places and he gets turned away every time. Turned away pretty harshly and pretty roughly, actually. Different groups of puzzle pieces who have already found their fit together waste no time telling Oliver that all of, about all of the ways that he doesn't fit. Too much blue, not enough red, too round, not enough square, too tall, too short, too pointy, too bulky, not right, all wrong. And finally, Oliver gets fed up. In an attempt to find his fit sooner rather than later, Oliver tries to change himself. He changes his shape, he changes his color. Eventually, he alters himself so that he is completely hidden behind everything. Not a bit of the real Oliver is visible. He changes everything about himself to fit into a space that looks nothing like his real self. But in this altered state, he fits, sort of. Over time, Oliver realizes that this fit that he has forced himself into isn't right either. It isn't as perfect as Oliver hoped it would be because even as he himself finally fits into a space, a space, not necessarily his space, he watches all of the other pieces around him continue to turn away other pieces that are just trying to fit in jeering and ridiculing them just like they teased Oliver himself. And y'all, the church in Corinth, the congregation that Paul sent this letter to, was in a pretty similar situation. Paul wrote to Corinth because the church was splintering apart. It was putting up walls and setting these troublesome and arbitrary distinctions between one subgroup in the congregation finger pointing, labeling, nitpicking, and excluding. So Paul sent this letter trying to bring unity, trying to bring togetherness into a fragmented church, trying to lift up the church as a whole and remind them not of the things that separate them, but the ultimate thing that brings them together, their faith in God through Jesus Christ. Now, before we dive into our scripture reading itself this morning, let's talk about Corinth as a city a little bit. We talked about Thessalonica last week. Let's talk about Corinth this week. Corinth was a large city, not too far from Athens, about 40 miles from Athens. And it was a diverse city. There were lots of, there was lots of com commerce. There were lots of cultures. There were lots of different religions and lots of artists filling up this city. And Corinth was a city of extremes. There were a few, a handful of exceptionally rich citizens and lots and lots of very poor citizens. And Cor uh, yeah, Corinth was a transitory city. There were lots of people who were doing everything they could to climb that socioeconomic ladder, and Corinth was kind of a middle rung on the ladder. When they got rich enough, wealthy enough, uh, uh, famous enough, they moved on to a different city, a bigger city, a better city. But Corinth was the middle rung. Ancient historians uh, made it clear that Corinth was known as the sin city of the ancient world. Now the Corinthian church sort of reflected this personality of this city. We see that in Paul's words in our text this morning. Paul says, now I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. Chloe's people gave me some information about you that you're fighting with each other. Now leave it to Paul to not beat around the bush. He sees a problem with the Corinthian church and he calls it out. Plain and simple. 
you are fighting with each other. Bam. Now, Paul goes on to detail some of the ways that they're putting up barriers between one another, namely who they were baptized by and who they belong to, who they follow. And Paul even gets in a little bit of a dig. I don't know if you caught it when we read our scripture this morning, but Paul says to them, thank God I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius so that nobody can say they were baptized in my name. Paul is kind of saying to them, leave me out of this. Just like those groups of puzzle pieces in our story, all that were all about enforcing the parameters, whatever, whatever little click they had created, the Corinthian church was all about deciding who was good enough and who was not. And if we're honest with ourselves, the church today is not really all that different from that ancient Corinthian church sometimes, is it? We have plenty of ways that we have created divisions among ourselves. Denominationally, progressive versus fundamental, traditional versus contemporary. We have lots of different size delineations. I like to call these the grouchy ladybug delineations because churches either say to themselves or say to each other, you're not big enough, right? We say you're not big enough for this program or that program. We say you're not big enough for this mission or that mission. You're not big enough for whatever. There are a thousand different ways that we draw lines and portion out the body of Christ today, aren't there? But just because that's what we do doesn't mean that's what we should do. One of the scholars that I read this week kind of got at the heart of this. He said, it can happen that we have become so accustomed to a divided church that we simply accept the situation. We have always known a divided church, and we are not shocked or dismayed because that is the way things are. Paul will not let the Corinthians or us be satisfied with the church in its divided condition. There may be no quick solution to the problem, but there can be no casual acceptance of it either. So let's revisit Oliver, our little puzzle piece friend, and the rest of his story. That new space that Oliver has found, you know, the one where he had to change everything about himself to fit in, still wasn't right. And Oliver finally comes to the realization that if he can't be himself, whatever fit he has found isn't the right fit for him. And so he sheds his disguise to the scorn and consternation of the pieces around him and strikes out on his own again. And he's glad to be himself again but he also finds himself alone again. And he returns to all of his worries and his fears that he will never find his fit. Oliver says, how can I be part of something exciting, wild, or out of this world if it's just me? But as he's wandering alone, Oliver finds a few other pieces who have also been trying their darndest to fit in even trying to alter their appearance, just like he did, to fit into a place, any place. And with these pieces, Oliver finally finds his perfect fit. Oliver discovered that you can't rush or force your fit. All you can do is be yourself. Your fit will find you and it will feel perfect. Friends, this is what Paul is getting at in our scripture reading this morning. He promotes togetherness right off the bat. Paul says, now I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other. And don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. Now, there's a very cyclical phrasing in the Greek here. That phrase that is translated as don't be divided into rival groups literally means no schisms, no splits. And the phrase that gets translated as be restored literally means be mended. So Paul is both recognizing the tears in the fabric of the Corinthian church's life 
and imploring them to stitch up those tears in the name of Christ. He later puts the importance of that reconciliation into some more theological context. Paul says, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And Christ didn't send me to preach the good news with clever words so that Christ's cross won't be emptied of its meaning. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those who are being saved. Paul is reminding the church in Corinth about their ultimate why, their purpose for being the church in the first place. It's not about them. It's not about who brought them into the faith. It's not even about who started the church in which they are now squabbling. It's not about Paul. It's about God and what God did for them through Jesus Christ. It is this message all of the love and grace and openness and acceptance and wide-armed welcome that Christ rained down from the cross that makes them the church. It's this message that opens the doors and erases those lines between them. It's this message that lets us all gather to lift up the same prayers and share the same bread and cup and join our voices in praise and thanksgiving together today. It's not about keeping us apart, it's about what unites us. Grace, unconditional love, Jesus Christ, and a God who was willing to give it all up for us on the cross. That's why every time when we come to the communion table, we did it last week, I say what I say. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what you bring with you, you are welcome here at this table and in this community. God has a place for you, just for you. And that is what matters. And for that, we welcome you and we love you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, we come to our time of prayer this morning. I have a number of prayer requests to share with you. We want to continue to pray for Sandy and for Linda and for Karen. Uh, Linda passed word along this week that the treatments that they started last week for the uh, radiation-related illnesses, illness that she has been dealing with, is starting to work. She's actually starting to feel better. Um, So we rejoice in that. We want to continue to pray for Alyssa and for her recovery after her knee surgery. Um, We want to pray for the family of Mary, for Ellen's friend Mary. Uh, We've been praying for Mary for a long time. Uh, And Mary passed away due to her cancer this week. So we want to lift her family up in prayer. We also want to lift up the family of Mike. Mike is Cynthia's uncle, uh, who also passed away this week. We want to continue to pray for Melissa's dad, Sean. Sean has been waiting to have uh, surgery for his brain tumor since before all of this uh, COVID-19 started. And he finally has a surgery date on the calendar a week from tomorrow. So we want to continue to pray for him and pray for that opening, um, that it will be possible. We want to pray for Jolene and her kids. Jolene is Jen and Mike's friend. Um, We prayed for Jolene and her kids about a year ago when she lost her husband to pancreatic cancer. Um, And in the year since, uh, her father has also been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and is receiving weekly chemo for that. And um, she just recently lost her mother. To pancreatic cancer and so they uh, and Jen Jen had the perfect word she said they just need some light uh, Jolene and her kids so we want to lift them up in prayer this morning we want to continue to pray for Anna uh, with her brain tumor that she is battling we want to continue to pray for Cynthia's cousin Julie who uh, is going through her second bout of chemo for breast cancer Um, We want to pray for Cole and Brittany. Cole is uh, Cody's brother. Brittany is his sister-in-law, and they are 
wonderfully and blessedly pregnant, um, but it is a high risk pregnancy. So we want to continue to lift them and that baby up in prayer. Uh, we also want to pray for Haley and Ed, Cameron's friend and her husband. They are rejoicing um, in a second pregnancy, but their marriage is struggling. Um, so balancing a, a wonderful joy and some serious heartache. So we want to lift them up in prayer. And friends, today is Mother's Day. Um, so we want to pray for mothers in all forms, uh, all of the mother figures that we've had in our life. So I invite you to pray with me this morning. Eternal God, on this day, we lift up all mothers to you, recognizing that by your grace, mothering takes many forms. We lift up those who have experienced joy and fulfillment in mothering. We lift up those who have known the pain of a child's death. We lift up those who are facing motherhood again or for the first time, especially Cole and Brittany, Jen and her husband, and Haley and Ed. We lift up those who have struggled with infertility and for whom this day represents a deep loss and a desperate ache. We lift up those who mother their children in their hearts, knowing that another family is loving and providing the best life for their child through adoption. We lift up those who lament their separation from their children for whatever reason. We lift up those who, as foster or adoptive parents, create a safe space for children fiercely seeking the love of a mother figure. Likewise, God, the experiences of being mothered are many and varied. We lift up those who have cherished memories of being mothered. We lift up those who may have suffered abuse, neglect, or emotional harm from their mothers. We lift up those who remember with joy being mothered by a broader community of women. We lift up those who have experienced or are in the midst of grief for the loss of a mother or mother figure. We lift up those who were adopted into the loving arms of a mother. We lift up those who are still seeking the love of a mother or a mother figure in some way. We lift up those who may continue to experience estrangement from their mother. We lift up those who in the image of God the mother find faith and comfort. On this special day, God, we lift up all those who have touched our lives with a mothering spirit and love in some way. Holy One who came as a child, we pray for your children everywhere. For those who are hungry, we pray for nourishment. For those who are fleeing, we pray for safety. For those who are ill, we pray for healing, <clears throat> especially Linda, Sandy, Karen, Alyssa, Sean, Anna, Julie, Lance, and all those who are suffering from this coronavirus. For those who are suffering, we pray for your presence. For those who are grieving, we pray for your peace, especially Mary's family and friends and Mike's family and friends. And we pray your special peace for them during this time when they cannot gather for a memorial service to honor their loved ones as we are used to doing. We also pray especially for Jolene and her kids. We pray your light for them in the midst of all of their pain and loss. Surround them with love. Surround them with relief. Surround them with hope. Holy Three, the embodiment and epitome of community, we pray for communities everywhere. For those who are divided, we pray for unity, especially Haley and Ed as their marriage struggles. For those who are isolated, we pray for connection. 
For those who are afraid, we pray for your courage, especially Cole and Brittany and this pregnancy. For those who are frustrated, we pray for new hope. Holy One, bless in us the work of faith that we might be truly faithful. Nourish us in the labor of love that we might show your love. Keep our hopes steadfast that we might know your grace and your peace as we wait for your coming reign of justice and overwhelming love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, shortly there will be a hymn posted on Facebook, our hymn for today. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, we've sung it a number of times. It's the hymn uh, here in this place, which is also called Gather Us In um, by Marty Hauer, Hauser, Hauer, something like that. Um, so I invite you to listen to that hymn this morning. I want to share just the last stanza of it with you because I think it speaks so dearly to what we've been talking about this morning. The last verse says, not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away. Here in this place, the new light is shining. Now is the kingdom and now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in all peoples together, fire of love in our flesh and our bone. As you go, or don't go, this morning, I want you to be blessed by the very last page of Oliver's story. The very last page, don't know where I put my book, says, don't forget, no puzzle is complete without every last piece, including you and Oliver too. If you're wondering, if you're wandering, if you're hesitating, if you're hoping, know that you can find a fit here and that with God, you will always fit. Friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>